Box 201. All right, so we are gonna, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, let me pull my notes up here. I want to welcome everybody um, that is joining us today for our uh, for our uh, redistricting data webinar and uh, redistricting local government redistricting update. Um, we've got a pretty diverse audience and people that are attending today. We've got a lot of city and county officials. As I look through the, who's who's on the list, city and county officials who are probably very interested in finding out what their populations are going to be in 2020. We've got uh, elected officials who are interested in redistricting process. We've got planners, analysts, and researchers who are looking at this from the aspect of this is the first 2020 census data that they're going to get. So we have a lot of interest um, in, in this presentation because I think we have a couple of really good speakers on hand who can help tell us how we're going to be able to access and use it. Uh, this is our second in our fall webinar series uh, that's designed to kind of get you ready for the 2020 data that's coming out in 2021. Our first one is, uh, we've got a video available of it. It's, it's about how to access census data using data.census.gov. That is one of the primary ways you will be able to retrieve the 2020 census data. Um, go back and look at that if you have um, some time. Uh, be sure to contact the State Data Center and we can hook you up with some training if you need some help in how to, how to access and use census data that comes out next, next spring sometime. Um, our second one is redistricting, and that one's today. Our third one is going to be on November 10th, and we're partnering with the Tennessee Geographic Information Consortium, or TENGIC, uh, to host a webinar on the IPAMS NHGIS. That's the National Historic GIS. It is uh, covering geographic U.S. census data, time series, and crosswalks, and that's going to be presented by Jonathan Schroeder from the IPAMS Center for Data Integration at the University of Minnesota, and it's focusing on uh, comparing dissimilar ge ge geography across historic census information. So we'll be able to we'll be looking at how, do, how can you compare census data from say like 1990, 2000, 2010, eventually 2020 to see how your community has changed, whether it's um, the demographics, the age, race, and ethnicity, makeup of the community, housing characteristic, income, and poverty, all these various measures that are captured over time. We can, look at, we can look at that information in a, in a time series, and he's gonna, he's gonna lead us through a very practical exercise aimed at uh, learning how to actually conduct those analyses. Uh, that webinar is gonna be at 2 p.m. also, and the details are on tnsdc.utk.edu, which is the State Data Center website. Um, this webinar is being recorded. You may have gotten a prompt about that. Um, during the webinar, please leave your mutes on. We don't have the full full-blown webinar account at, at UT where we're hosting this webinar. So please leave your mutes on. Erin Hatfield is uh, going to be is our communications person. She's going to be kind of just checking to make sure that those stay on. And I'd also encourage you to use, use the chat to ask your questions. Um, and when you're doing that, when you're typing your questions into the chat, it's probably set to everyone in terms of who you want to address that to. Just try to leave that set to everyone so that um, everyone can see the questions that are gonna be asked. We will not ask our, our presenters to answer them in chat. We'll present those questions, we'll pose them to them, uh, collect them and let them answer them so that everyone can hear the response. Um, so just a few thanks. First, thank you to everyone who registered. We had a great response to this uh, webinar. We were hoping that we would and we did. So thank you for taking a little bit of time to, to join us this afternoon. Thanks to Aaron. Um, who's handled a lot of communications and is, is in, uh, uh, host, in charge of hosting this for us today. And then uh, thanks to our two speakers. I'm gonna start by introducing James Whitehorn, uh, who's gonna give us an update on the 2020 Census Redistricting Data Program. And James is the Chief of the Redistricting and Voting Rights Office at the Census Bureau, so we couldn't have find a better person to, to speak with about this topic. He started in the Geography Division in 2006 and has worked on things like redistricting data program, as well as the Participant Statistical Area Program, which a lot of people across Tennessee helped in drafting of new census tracts that will be used in 2020. Um, so James, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. I think you've got your screen teed up and are ready to go. And I wanna thank you again for doing this presentation for us. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, so is everyone, you're able to see the screen, is that correct?
unless you chime in, I'll, I'll assume that you can. So we can. Um, We're good to go. All right, excellent. Thank you. Uh, so I'm I'm very happy to be here today, and and thank you, Tim, for the the invitation to to speak with everyone. Today I'm going to talk about the 2020 Census Redistricting Data Program, why it exists, what it does, what you can expect from it as we move towards the eventual delivery of the census counts as well. Let me make sure I get this there. We go. Okay. So the term redistricting brings to mind many concepts and electoral practices. But in regards to the Census Bureau, it's a pretty straightforward thing. Uh, and it's captured by our overall mission uh, of the redistricting data program itself. And that mission is laid out by Public Law 94171, which directs the Bureau to do two things. The law requires us to establish a program that allows the states to identify the small area geographic tabulations that they need for conducting legislative redistricting. And historically, those areas have been identified as voting districts, census blocks, and other electoral geography like legislative and congressional districts. The second thing we're required to do is to deliver to the persons and the bodies with the initial responsibility of legislative apportionment and districting the, the identified tabulations in those geographies they specified as well as other geographies. And we're required to do that by one year from census day. Uh, we've interpreted that to mean that the, the group that, of official recipients is the governors the legislative leadership of both parties and both chambers of the legislature, and then any other public, public bodies like redistricting commissions that have sitting members. Most importantly, we have an umbrella requirement for the program, which is that the entire process must be conducted in a nonpartisan manner. Uh, one of the ways we accomplish this is by having the state legislative leadership of both parties agree on a nonpartisan liaison who can represent the state in a nonpartisan manner, and we work with them throughout the program. Uh, for the state of Tennessee, we work with Ms. Susan Goulet and Matthew Hill, who we'll hear from uh, in just a little bit, uh, both from the Office of Local Government. The redistricting data program's role is to design a program to achieve the work, establish the program criteria, collect that small area geography, identify the required tabulations, and make sure that they get delivered. So since the law was passed in 1975, that makes this the fifth decade of the program. And for most of those decades, we've designed a program with several phases. Uh, for 2020, we had a five phase program. I'll go over these in more detail in a minute, but they're the block boundary suggestion project, voting district project, the uh, crucial data delivery, uh, collection of new plans, and then an evaluation uh, that we call the view from the state. So phase one was the block boundary suggestion project. It kicked off in December of 2015 and was successfully completed in July of 2017. It was open to all states, DC, Puerto Rico, uh, and it allowed the states to identify and provide features that they need to be block boundaries when the 2020 tabulation blocks are produced. And by features, I mean roads, waterways, mountain ridges, anything that you can think of as being represented by a line on the map. The blocks themselves aren't created until now, so that's one of the, the, the pieces of processing that's going on uh, back here at Census. But the idea is that when those blocks are created, the features that were flagged by the states will be used as boundaries, along with the features that Census deems as necessary for our work. Now, in addition to making those block suggestions, states could uh, provide missing features. So if you had uh, a new uh, uh, subdivision built, you could uh, add the new roads. Um, if we had features that were out of place, they could be realigned. We could get updates to area landmarks. These are things like state parks or prison areas. Um, they could review the block size review. We had something called prototype blocks that we created uh, using the software that, that we're using now to create the actual blocks uh, that showed with a, a, an ordinal measurement of size of how many housing units would end up in a block. So if the block was gonna be too large, the state could provide a, a split for that block. Uh, and it would become an actual new block. Uh, but most importantly, I think the, the, the big innovation for this decade was that we aligned with the boundary and annexation survey and we were allowed to accept suggested updates to legal boundaries. We still had to pass those to the boundary and annexation survey, but, uh, 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 but we were allowed to at least get those suggestions in, in the door. Uh, we had great participation here. Tennessee participated fully. Um, we actually had 41 of the 52 eligible states participate for that part of the program. Phase two, uh, the second part of the small area geography uh, collection in the, in the program. 
uh, is that collection of voting districts. And when I say voting districts, in, in census terminology, a voting district is the equivalent of a precinct or a ward, um, the, that small electoral piece of geography. So at the beginning of phase two, uh, since these, these program phases uh, each take a couple years, we sent letters of invitation to our liaisons, notifying of the start of the program. And then we also sent a notice to the governors and legislative leaders in each state to notify them that it, the program was starting up and also letting them know who their official liaisons were, just in case there had been any shifting in that uh, group of people, those legislative leaders due to elections or, or retirements. The collection for phase two ran from January to May of 2018. And then we had two subsequent rounds of verification to ensure that we were processing and maintaining those boundaries correctly. Uh, and we also had this program, part of the program open for the same updates that I mentioned for BBSP with missing features, misaligned features, area landmarks, and legal updates. So phase three, this is probably what most people are interested in, uh, especially considering where we are in the life cycle of the program. And it's our next major activity. In a typical census, we would know the timeline for the deliveries for these products uh, years in advance, and it would have been well communicated by now. Uh, I am hopeful that we'll have a new concrete schedule to share in the not too distant future, but unfortunately we do not have that today. I'm beginning to get a picture of what the schedule is going to be, and we will be making sure we communicate that and communicate it broadly uh, as soon as we get that locked down. For those who are working to prepare for the release of the census data, we do have something called prototype data products. Uh, there's a, a link here in the deck and, and I've provided the deck to, to Tim so it can be distributed after the, the presentation for folks to make it easier for them to find them. These prototype products are examples of the geographic and tabulation products that we're planning to create. Uh, and we made them from the 2018 end to end census test and they do exhibit the content and the schemas that we intend to use for the 2020 products. Uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's only for Providence, Rhode Island, because that's where we did the test, but it really is a good example of what's gonna be produced for the nation. The reason we have difficulty in establishing a new schedule, and for, for some of you who may be aware, uh, if you've been keeping up on census in the news, uh, the Census Bureau has mentioned publicly that in order to deliver the apportionment counts as soon as possible, we've decoupled some data processing, processing activities that would have happened uh, alongside the preparations for apportionment uh, because those activities were only needed for redistricting and not apportionment. So with doing that, it's gonna take us a few more weeks to accommodate those changes and then produce an updated schedule for the official redistricting release. Um, now I am happy to say that although it's not yet official, I am very hopeful uh, and growing more confident that we'll be able to complete the delivery of the geographic products to all states, DC and Puerto Rico by early March. We'll be working to provide the redistricting tabulations as close to the statutory deadline as possible while assuring the quality of that data. Uh, it is likely but not yet determined that we will move from uh, to a single data delivery rather than a tiered weekly delivery as originally planned. So typically when we release the, the counts for the redistricting data program, uh, we take a group of states each week and uh, we, we release that group uh, and then each subsequent week we release more states. In order to accommodate uh, trying to get as close to the statutory deadline as possible, uh, we'll very likely move to where we'll do one delivery to all the states on the same day with a national release. And I'll talk about how the release will work in just a moment. So the geographic products that people can expect um, there's, of course, going to be shape files, census shape files, uh, also known as tiger line shape files. Uh, these are the geographic files that are used by geographic information systems for uh, electronic or digital cartography and, and geographic manipulation. Uh, we'll have maps. These are going to be in PDF format. They're large scale maps, so they can be pr printed on large plotters. They have a lot of detail. Uh, we'll have county block maps, so a county will be able to have a, a full size map, which indicates all of the blocks within the county. Uh, we'll have state legislative district maps with their voting district uh, overlaid. Uh, we'll have track maps and we'll have school district maps. We're also going to have some tabular data products. Uh, one is called the block assignment files and they come with something called a name lookup table. And I'll talk about them in a little more in just a second. Uh, then we'll also have something called a block to block relationship file. And this is a crosswalk of 2010 blocks to 2020 blocks. A lot of people don't realize that each decade 
we essentially throw out the previous decade's block and rerun our, our block algorithm uh, and create new blocks. And this, uh, this crosswalk will help people who, if they need to, uh, as Tim was saying, that uh, next week's or, or the next talk that you guys have, we'll talk about trying to compare over time. This is a tool that can be used to help compare between two decennial censuses. For the shape files, we are providing a large number of shape files for use by states and the public. Uh, you can see in looking at these lists, there is some duplication between the two. Uh, this is intentional and in that some of the, the most used shape files are provided both for individual counties, but also as a state layer so that the work of merging the counties doesn't have to be done by the end user. And also so that smaller jurisdictions who are maybe working at the county or sub-county level don't have to work with the entire state file. So that is completely intentional. And then for folks who, uh, are GIS savvy or work in, work in the GIS geographic information system world, uh, we are including something that's called a topological faces. This is the individual polygons, uh, the very smallest uh, uh, area components that are in the Tiger database, the Tiger Line database, and they have the attributes of every geography that is listed here. So that if you want to build a topologically integrated database, uh, you can do so directly from those county topological faces files. Uh, this is just to mention a, a demonstration of the, the PDF map. This is a block map uh, just showing you it has a great deal of detail. Every block is labeled. Uh, these can be very useful for uh, especially small jurisdictions that perhaps don't have access to GIS resources or um, want to just have something that they can look at visually while they're working on it uh, using tabular data uh, alongside a, a printed map. Uh, but then we also have these uh, block assignment file tables and name lookup tables. And essentially the block assignment file is a listing of all the blocks in the state. And then it has the, uh, the geographic code for that specific geography. So in this illustration here, we're showing the MCDs, the, the uh, townships within uh, the state of Rhode Island. This is just a snippet of the file, but it lists the blocks and it lists the code. And then the name lookup table has the same code for the geography so that you can identify and see, oh, these blocks that are all within this geography are Providence City. Uh, it's just an extra tool. And this is helpful for people who want to work with crunching numbers outside of uh, the uh, a GIS system. They just want to look at the, the, the numbers themselves. Now, if you've worked with the census redistricting data before, this is going to look very familiar to you. Uh, and you should be pretty comfortable with what we've got here. Uh, we have the, the first five tables here are the exact same as what we produced for the 2010 census. So we have the table P1 for race, P2 for race for the voting age population, P3 for the Hispanic or Latino and not Hispanic or Latino by race. Uh, and then the P4 is the same, but for the voting age population. And then a housing unit count table uh, with a characteristic of vacant or occupied. So you know whether the housing unit was labeled as vacant or occupied. We do have a new table, the group quarters population by group quarters type. This is only for total population. It doesn't have the demographic breakdown. And it's for group quarters, which are things like correctional institutions for adults, college, university, student housing, or military quarters. Uh, these tend to be populations that uh, many states now uh, reallocate from where census counts them to a, another, an alternate address uh, to alter their redistricting data before they begin their work. So this table is just added as a tool to help them with that bridging of that work. All of the tables that you see here will be available at the block level. So the smallest level of geography for which census publishes statistics. If you aren't familiar with what these are, um, here's just a, a brief illustration of how these tables are organized. Uh, the race table, uh, ever since uh, census or 2000, 1997, the Office of Management and Budget uh, which directs how the federal government collects and, and reports race and ethnicity, uh, said that people should be allowed on a survey like the census to be able to select uh, one or more races. So in order to represent that in a table, uh, we, we report it just as reported by the respondent. So if someone says that they are white alone or black or African American alone or American Indian Alaska Native alone, they would end up in this population of one race that you see on your screen with just the white alone or black alone or American Indian Alaska Native alone category. If they pick two races, they would end up in the two or more races. And someone can do that all the way down 
iterated until we get to all six races. The version of the table for the population 18 years and over, the voting age population, is exactly the same layout. We just substitute the universe so that the people that are being reported in the table are only those who are 18 years or older. We have a very similar uh, situation with the, uh, the Hispanic or Latino and not Hispanic or Latino by race. Anyone who declares themselves that they are Hispanic, have a Hispanic or Latino ethnicity, would be counted in the Hispanic or Latino group and all the remainder of the people in, uh, in the census who said that they were not Hispanic or Latino are iterated through those same categories all the way to, all the way to six or more races uh, as indicated in the previous table. Uh, and then of course the Hispanic or Latino for the voting age uh, is again the same table in the same layout, but we just substitute the population for those who are 18 years or older. The housing unit counts, very straightforward. Total, total housing unit count, uh, number of occupied housing units, number of vacant housing units. And then of course, I already described the table P5, the group quarters type, uh, just a reminder, it's for total population only, no demographics. But again, all these tables are available down to the block level. So how are people gonna get this data? How is this gonna come out to the public? So the official recipients, which I mentioned earlier, uh, from a Census Bureau standpoint are the governors, the legislative leadership in both chambers, uh, the redistricting commissions if they exist and if they have commissioners named, so we have someone that we can actually deliver to. And we're gonna be delivering two ways this decade. Uh, we're gonna have physical media. There's gonna be a case that's gonna be sent by overnight tracked mail uh, with a DVD and a flash drive in it. The DVD and the flash drive will have the exact same information on them. Uh, it's just in case someone doesn't have an optical reader or someone has their uh, USB ports locked out because of uh, security considerations in the office. So we're sending it in two methods uh, just to make it more accessible. Um, we will send that overnight, uh, but and the day that those uh, physical media are supposed to be arriving at the addresses for the official recipients, we will also open up what we call embargoed access to the data.census.gov platform. And Tim mentioned this as a, a previous uh, uh, webinar that has been put on about how to access data. With the retirement of the American Fact Finder, we now have the data.census.gov as that, that platform replacement. Uh, and so we'll have, uh, we'll work with the official recipients to get them signed up in advance so that uh, as that data is supposed to be arriving in the physical media, they'll also have the option to log into a protected uh, embargoed version of the same data set on data.census.gov. We're then going to use the web monitoring tools that we've built internally to see if someone's logged in to view and, and download that data and the tracking numbers from the physical products. Um, so we have both channels to try to, to see if the data has been received. We're making phone calls to confirm that it's been received. And that way we can make sure that we're meeting our legal obligation to get this data out to the states. But then we also have to get it to the public. So uh, the next day after that data is received by the states and we've confirmed that it's been received, uh, we will turn on the public version of data.census.gov with the full data set. It'll have a full data explorer functionality. And we've also added in uh, as a requirement to support the redistricting data program that the public uh, and anyone using data.census.gov should be able to use this large data download function. And the way that's defined is uh, you should be able to pick all census blocks for all the tables in the PL redistricting file downloadable at once. Uh, so this was a limitation that American Fact Finder couldn't, uh, uh, couldn't overcome, uh, but we have managed to overcome that in data.census.gov. So that way you will be able to go in and just pick your tables, pick your block level data, and you can pull the whole state down at once if that's helpful to you. Uh, we're also gonna have our expert user version on the FTP site. These are text files. Um, this is the full suite of all geographies, all data um, for the redistricting data set. These are relational tables that need to be imported into uh, a database structure and, and linked together. Uh, there's a new data for, if you've worked with this in the past decades, there's a new data segment to accommodate that group quarters table. It's now gonna be the third data segment. Uh, and an important note here for people who are planning to use this, the prototype data that I mentioned earlier used our old format of using a fixed width geo header, which is the geography file, and then comma delimited uh, files for the data where the actual counts are reported. Uh, we've switched all of these files to be pipe to limited text files. So 
uh, you can use a single sort of importer uh, to get those in to your, your software. But I want to make sure people are aware of that if they're preparing in advance. So once we deliver the data to the states, then the, the hard work in each, uh, each state capital will go on of trying to draw the new congressional and state legislative districts. Um, phase four is when we go back to the states actually after they've completed that work and we ask for those boundaries back to us. Uh, it's a little different than the previous phases because the previous geography phases are just a once a decade run, but this will do every two years throughout the course of the decade to make sure we're keeping our boundaries current so that we have current boundaries for reporting through things like the American Community Survey and all the other survey work that the Census Bureau does. So we'll be reaching back out in uh, uh, late 2021 through early 2022 to try our best to make sure we collect as many of those plans as are ready. And then finally, we do a big look back. Uh, we'll, we'll work with all the liaisons and other stakeholders to identify what worked well, what we could improve for the next decennials redistricting data program. We'll look at the legal landscape to identify future needs the program should address. And we'll take all this information together and we'll create a report that's called the View from the States. And this actually ends up being our guiding document as we develop uh, the next decennials program. So it's already on the radar to be starting the work for 2030. So now I'm gonna uh, switch to another data product uh, that's not part of the PL94-171 data set, but it's a very important product for uh, folks who work in redistricting. Uh, this is um, called the Citizen Voting Age Population by Race and Ethnicity, or we'll, we'll shorten that to CVAP uh, typically. And we've, producing, we've been producing a CVAP data set from the American Community Survey, one of the other surveys, the sample surveys that the Census Bureau conducts. Uh, we've been producing that every year since 2011. However, next year, we're going to produce two uh, CVAP data sets. In early February, we're going to publish the traditional American Community Survey-based CVAP. Uh, the smallest unit of geography in that data set is going to be the block group, and it's going to be a 2010 census version of the block groups because the data that this is based on is the 2015 to 2019 ACS five-year estimates. And those estimates are published using 2010 statistical geography as their base, because it's the 19 is the final year, and so it still looks back as opposed to moving to the next decade. But we will also publish a CVAP based on the 2020 census using administrative records to determine the citizenship characteristic. Its publication date is still being worked out, and there are two main differences for this product. Uh, one, it's going to include the category some other race alone. This is not a category that's in the ACS, but it's a category that helps make this file more compatible with table P4 from the PL file. Uh, the other main difference is that this data set will be published at the block level using 2020 geography, so it will nest really nicely within all the other 2020 geographies that you're trying to work with. So now that uh, we've talked about getting the data out, I want to talk just a little bit about how we're changing how we protect the data that we provide uh, and perfect, protect the respondent data uh, that we then turn into aggregate statistics and get out the door. The Census Bureau's commitment to privacy and confidentiality is critical to our ability to produce high quality statistics about the nation. Protecting the privacy of respondents and the confidentiality confidentiality of their data is both a legal requirement and it's also an institutional cultural uh, requirement. All the information that we collect about our respondents is protected under Title 13 of the U.S. Code. And as part of that, it says that the Census Bureau, uh, the United States Code prohibits the Census Bureau from releasing identifiable data furnished by any particular establishment or individual. And we're sworn to life to protect that. The challenge we face is that we collect all this information in order to fill the mission of producing quality statistics about the nation. Information tabulated from the decennial census is used for a wide array of purposes. You know, we, we talked about apportionment for redistricting, but also for distributing over $675 billion each year back to the states. Our data is used for critical decision-making at all levels of government. It enables policymakers and businesses and analysts and researchers to measure and assess trends about where we're going as a society. But to support all these data users, 
uh, and these data uses requires publishing an enormous amount of statistics and tables, often at a very fine level of geography. And unfortunately, we now know that every time you publish any statistic calculated from a confidential data source, you reveal or leak a tiny bit of private information in the process. In 2003, in what's become known as the database reconstruction theorem, Dinner and Nissen demonstrated that if you release too many statistics at too high a degree of accuracy, you'll eventually reveal the entire underlying confidential data source. The challenge is even greater when you consider the privacy threats that we face today. Uh, plus, they, you know, they say nothing goes away on the internet, and the same can be said for data once it's gone out the door. Over the past 20 to 30 years, we've seen a massive proliferation of data that can potentially be used to re-identify individuals and statistical data products. Data are, are collected all the time by companies that we interact with, by data brokers, through social media, and then of course, not to mention the, the huge amounts of personal information that are available uh, because of data breaches over the years. And these data, these very data can be used in an attempt to pick out specific individuals in the data that we're publishing. So meanwhile, um, not just with the data, the technology has improved. Computers can easily perform complex matching algorithms to that are necessary to leverage external data in order to reestablish or re-identify individuals. So these are not abstract concerns. They represent real concrete threats to protecting the confidentiality of data that needs to be addressed. So with the risk of reconstruction and re-identification in mind, and the knowledge that these types of attacks are getting easier and easier as computers improve and external data about us increases, the Census Bureau decided to conduct an experiment to see how vulnerable the decennial census is to this type of attack. The 2010 census collected a handful of attributes for approximately 309 million people in the U.S. for a total of 1.9 billion confidential data points. Yet the 2010 census data products released over 150 billion aggregate statistics derived from that data. So the Census Bureau wanted to see if that was enough to reconstruct the individual level records. And yes, our, our research was an emphatic yes. In fact, only using a small portion of 2010 public data products, the Census Bureau researchers were able to accurately reconstruct individual level data for all 6 million inhabited blocks in the U.S. We were also able to reconstruct detailed individual level information, including sex, age to within a year, race and ethnicity for 71% of the entire population. And then linking these reconstructed records to commercially available data from that same period, we were able to confirm accurate re-identification on all variables for 52 million individuals. So, over the past century, the Census Bureau has been a world leader in design and implementation of statistical methods to safeguard privacy and public data releases. As new privacy threats were identified over the years, we've worked hard to improve our statistical safeguards to mitigate those threats. So our adoption of something called formal privacy for the 2020 Census is merely the latest step in a long history of innovation and continuous improvement in our privacy protections, and a necessary one to counter the the 21st century privacy threats that I just mentioned. I know the increase of, of this, all this external data, increasingly powerful algorithms to make re-identification of individuals and statistics easier. Uh, another name for formal privacy is differential privacy, which is the specific type of privacy that we're applying for the 2020 census. All the data products I mentioned today, with the exception of apportionment, will have disclosure avoidance techniques applied uh, as we've done for the last several decades. And I, I do, yes, I do mean the, the PL 94171 registering data will also have differential privacy applied. Uh, there's a lot of information on our website and it can do a much better job of explaining uh, the process and technique behind this. Uh, so I do support that. And, and there's some links in this uh, presentation, both here and actually some slides that come after my, my end slide for folks to take a look at um, that I think will, will be very informative if they're interested in this. Uh, another way that you can you can uh, uh, experiment with differential privacy is that we've been producing what we call demonstration data products using 2010 census data as its source. We make these available 
periodically so that data users can can apply your use case to them to see how the outcomes would have been affected by the use of differential privacy. Uh, we released our initial run of a full demonstration data product back in October of last year, and this was to show that we could do this at the scale of a decennial census and also to demonstrate what progress we'd made to that date. We've followed with something called PPMFs, which look like, look like individual census records, but they're actually privacy protected records that have been processed through the differential privacy protection system. It's a bit difficult to work with those 300 million plus record files. So the folks at IPUMS and HGIS, the National Historic GIS, uh, that I, I again, uh, nicely ties in with uh, the next session that, that uh, the State Data Center is going to uh, convene. Uh, they converted these PPMFs into tables that data users would recognize, so they look more like the products that we would have produced at the Census Bureau. Our latest version from September 17th shows not only the progress to date, but also the changes that we've made to focus solely on the, the redistricting data for this initial uh, release of differentially private data. I do have to point out, though, that there was an error found in this latest version that makes the data appear a bit more accurate in, in the person data than it would have otherwise. Uh, we held occupied housing at the block level as an invariant, as an unchangeable, um, and that is not uh, what we expect to be doing for the final uh, release. Uh, but we have corrected that in our code, and we've committed to ensuring that a level of accuracy in future releases of the data in these PPMFs that is comparable or better than the data from this latest one from September 17th. Uh, and as, we, as you can see, it reflected in the detailed metrics that we, we also published alongside that. And we also do expect to produce at least one more PPMF prior to the Data Stewardship uh, Executive Policy Committee making its final decisions on where to set uh, invariance and epsilon, epsilon being the, the value that controls the accuracy versus privacy trade-off in a differential privacy world. And I think with that, I would stop and I will go ahead and Stop sharing my screen, and I believe we're going to do questions at the end. Yeah, thanks, James. We are, appreciate all that information. It's uh, that was a great presentation. I do hope that you folks have some questions you can ask to James. Again, please throw those into the chat. We'll queue them up. Some of you may have the same questions, and we'll go through and and uh, feed those through. Um, I am going to drop a link to um, a YouTube video from Minute Physics. That is uh, a 12 minute video on differential privacy. But it's a, it's a great animation that explains a little bit more about this topic. And, um, and hopefully you begin to understand some of the significance of it. At the university, we're watching differential privacy very closely. We may eventually lead a, a webinar with some Census Bureau folks and perhaps some university folks on what this means about the data and uh, its potential impact on the counts. Um, we are looking at it both from the municipal level and the county level in terms of the populations and how that changes as a result of differential privacy, potentially things like funding, as well as the demographic characteristics uh, that are used in a variety of uh, uses across the state, no matter what they are. So we'll be, we'll be getting, sharing more information about that. Uh, I'm going to transition now to Matthew Hill. Matthew, you can go ahead and start sharing just so that people can see. We can make sure you get that up on uh, the screen for people to see. Matthew Hill is our next speaker. He's a senior GIS uh, specialist at, at the Tennessee Comptroller of the Treasury working in the Office of Local Government. He has um, worked there for 16 years and he presided over the redistricting process for local government officials for the last 10 years. Um, he also serves as, as, as mentioned, as Tennessee's liaison to the Census Bureau for redistricting um, and city annexations and de-annexations. So those are very important geography updates that, that he mentioned. Um, Matthew, it looks like you're ready to go. Welcome and thank you for joining us. All right, thank you. Tim, can you tell me, can you see my uh, full presentation or is it my note screen? Uh, I see both. <laughs> you see both? I see your okay. note screen, yep. Okay, yeah, let me try one more time. All right, is that, is that did you just see, that's, that's it? That's it, perfect. All right, well, thanks for having me, and my name is Matthew Hill, as Tim said, and I am with the uh, Tennessee State Comptroller's Office of Local Government, 
And as you can probably tell by our name, our office works with and supports the local governments in numerous ways. And one of those ways is um, through the redistricting process. And this is made easier in the fact that our office already serves as the Tennessee's redistricting liaison to the Census Bureau. Additionally, since 2016, we have served as the liaison for the Boundary and Annexation Program, or BAS for short, for all matters related to the annexations or de-annexations, or AKA the cities here in Tennessee, as well as have been assigned by the governor as the state's certifying officers for those city boundaries. Essentially, our job is to make sure that the data flows to the Census Bureau in an accurate manner. So today I'm gonna to be covering the where we are now, the redistricting timeline, then I'll, I'll discuss the state's preparation, and finally we'll wrap up with what uh, to start thinking about, especially if you're a local official. And then we can turn it over, I think time permitting for some questions and some answers. So let's catch up on the where we are now. I know James covered this, but they are, there are five phases to the redistricting process. We've just finished phase one, the Block Boundary Suggestion Program. This is where we worked with local officials, planners, GIS folks, um, to make those suggestions for those block boundaries. Uh, and just as a reminder, the census blocks are what we use to redistrict in Tennessee. And now we just wrapped up phase two, which is the voting district project. This was the phase where election officials verified their voting precincts. So this means that redistricting is next. So for us, I like to say uh, redistricting is kind of like our Super Bowl. Some people actually compare redistricting to a locust. You know, it kind of, it sits idly by for about 10 years and then poof, it magically appears and it says, I'm back. But it wasn't always like that, especially here in Tennessee. Before 1960, Tennessee had not redistr redistricted since 1901. In fact, back then, many states did not redistrict at the time. It really wasn't until 1962 when Charles Baker, then the Shelby County mayor, filed suit against the Tennessee Secretary of State, Joe Carr, arguing that Tennessee had not redistricted since 1901, even though the state constitution said to do so. The Supreme Court took up the issue and ultimately decided that the courts could step into matters related to redistricting. As a result, the Baker versus Carr laid the framework for the Voting Rights Act, equal representation and reapportionment, and the one man, one vote. Essentially, it uh, fundamentally altered the nature of political representation in America, requiring not just Tennessee, but nearly every state to redistrict during this time. And this is why we, why we redistrict. So therefore, redistricting is not optional. Per Tennessee code, this is something that every county will have to complete. And it is during this time that the county commission districts and legislative districts will need to be reconfigured to take into account areas of population growth or decline. Voting precincts will also need to be re reconfigured for those changes. And that is why it's important and what is at, what's at stake. So in Tennessee, we have about 1,626 county commissioners, uh, 849 uh, county commission districts, almost 2,000 voting precincts, almost 4 million registered voters, 99 House districts, 33 Senate districts, and nine congressional districts. So as you can see, it's an essential to a representative government. So now let's look at where we are now, and I'm gonna discuss the redistricting timeline. The first one uh, is what we're looking at as far as a geography data release. Um, as James touched on a little bit, we're looking for a December 2020 through March 2021 geographic data release. This is the geography that will be used for the redistricting, things like the roads, the, uh, the cities or the places. That is where all the data that will be used for, um, for the 2020 redistricting process will come from. That is followed by April 2021, or this is also subject to change as you've heard from, from James. This is the AKA, as I like to call it, the population data will get released. This is followed by May 2021, and if the, if the population data does get released in April 2021, we're looking at a May, 2020, May 2021 local redistricting kickoff date. This is the official date when the software data and maps will get released to those officials. And finally, the, uh, probably the most important deadline is the local redistricting deadline, which is December 31st, 2021. This is when all the counties will need to have their redistricting plans done. 
uh, generally I say the earlier better, the earlier the better. This is especially important for the next date because while the locals are redistricting, the, the legislature is also redistricting. Um, the quicker generally that you get your plans into us, the quicker that um, we can send those plans to the legislature in hopes that they will reduce those splits, especially for the voting precincts um, for our uh, election administrators. So looking at the timeline, you can kind of see that we've only have around seven months to complete local redistricting. So how do we get from a database from databases to a completed redistricting plan in seven months? Well, we prepare. We've been preparing for it. We've been preparing for this since 2010. First, with the phases you saw earlier, and then we also handle all the processing of the data, every detail from roads down to the individual census blocks. Uh, it's about 1.2 million pieces of data. Next, we also break down all that census information into maps and population figures and distribute it to the local officials responsible for redistricting. So here's an example of a map that was given out to, uh, in this particular scenario, Murray County for their redistricting process. Uh, it's color coded and it shows, it represents those districts outside of a positive or negative 10% deviation. So with this map, you can visually see that districts five and 11 need to lose population. And we can also see that the districts one, two, three and nine need to gain population. But this map just shows us one part of the equation. It doesn't exactly show the exact amount each district would need to lose or gain. That's where those population tables come in. It shows us the overall deviation. I don't know how well this will, uh, you can see this on your screen. And it also shows us how far or how off um, each district is. So in this particular instance, it shows us that district three needs to gain about 1500 people, while district 11 needs to lose about 5,120 people. So that's where those population tables come in and can, uh, and, and can work. The next part of how we prepare and help assist local officials is we also rely on technology. And here's a quick video. Suppose you don't agree done. that this thing's gonna be turned over to a computer and a man who runs it. Uh, the idea of uh, creating a legislative system through the use of a computer and, and someone who really knows nothing about the political balance and so on in the state uh, is obviously not a very happy uh, thought to anybody who's actively engaged in politics. When I first started doing redistricting, we used adding machines, handheld adding machines. Today, anyone with a PC can buy off-the-shelf software and do what it cost us $8 million to do 25 years ago. And now we're also going to the ability of using software that could superimpose Earth Google Maps over what you're doing. This is almost redistricting in 3D. So while we won't be redistricting in 3D here in Tennessee, we, uh, we will be relying on technology. Now, now you're more than welcome if you're old school and you want to use those adding machines, you're more than welcome to. But for this, for this round of redistricting, we will be relying on GIS technology. And for this go around, the Comptroller's Office, we have developed a no-cost ESRI ArcGIS desktop extension. Um, those that went through this redistricting last time may remember it. It is very easy to learn. And did I mention also, it was also free. In addition, we are also exploring a COVID-friendly web-based redistricting option. Um, we're still looking at it, but regardless of what we will have, regardless of what we will have, we will also be there to support you guys, and it will be free to use. So what else are we doing to, to prepare? Well, we are finalizing our guide to local redistricting. This is the comprehensive guide to all things redistricting in Tennessee. Well, whether this is your first, second, or third time involved with redistricting, this guide is a good place to start. It provides an in-depth review of the legal, technical, and all the data requirements to complete your local redistricting plan. And as soon as the redistricting guide is complete, the uh, distribution will be made to all, to all involved parties. And additionally, it will also be hosted on our website and we'll send out that information when that's available. Finally, I'd be remiss to to uh, finally, I'd be remiss to say that we also rely on partnerships, partnerships with the local governments and the UT's C task office or county technical assistance services. Um, without those partnerships, local redistricting would be nearly impossible. And this graphic kind of explains the workflow local redistricting takes in Tennessee. It flows out from the U.S. Census Bureau 
comes directly to our office. Our office then takes that data, and divides it up, and then partners with CTASC and or local governments to complete the redistricting, uh, redistricting um, process. So it really, it, it truly is a collaborative effort to pull off redistricting. And I want to give out a huge shout out to CTASC. I saw a couple of them on this, uh, on this call. We couldn't do it without them. So this brings me kind of to my next point, what local officials should be thinking about. First, you need to start thinking about the level of assistance your county needs. There will be three options. The first option is someone internally in your county assisting you. This is, this is ideal if you have a GIS department or a technical savvy person. The, CTA, the second option is using your CTAS representative. This is ideal if, uh, if you do not have a GIS department or you have a good working relationship with your CTAS representative. The third option to think about is our office assisting you. This is ideal if the following options are not best for your county. Whatever route your county though does take, training will be provided to the appropriate personnel on the desired software solution. Second thing to start thinking about is start looking at forming a redistricting committee. With the data stated to be released in that April timeframe, we're recommending a spring 2021 um, formation. Now, although this committee is not a statutory requirement, most counties do find that it greatly helps facilitate the process. In fact, most of our counties do for, uh, form a redistricting process. Also, I wanna say that the membership in the county legislative body is not required to serve on this reapportionment committee. And adding others in there is often helpful. Personally, our office, we recommend including the administrator of elections in the redistricting process. This can help cut down on, on costs related to mailing out new voter cards to, to the registered voters there. Next, while you've, got, while you've got your redistricting committee formed, start thinking about the makeup of the county commission districts. Now is the time to decide if changes are needed in the number of districts or in the number of commissioners. Remember, whatever gets adopted stays in place for the next year, next 10 years. So this is, a, this is the opportune time to change that should you wish to do that. And last thing to think about is remember, your county's redistricting plan is not over with until all the boundaries are set. So you've got your county commission districts, your highway districts, school board, constables, and also your voting, pre voting precincts. When all of these are set, your county is complete with its redistricting. And finally, I'll kind of wrap up my presentation with this. I've talked a lot, a lot about the local redistricting process, and I know we get asked that, who does the legislative redistricting? Well, Tennessee's congressional and state legislative district lines are drawn by the legislature, generally by the controlling party, which is currently Republican. They use internal staff, contractors, or, a, or other means, such as legislative legal services, to draw those lines. And uh, on the timeline that you saw earlier, that plan is typically released in January of 2022 when they come back in session. So also, I'd also be reminisced without acknowledging the rest of the redistricting team. There's also John Thomas and Ned Phillips in our office. And here is our contact information along with theirs. So in conclusion, just remember that we have a team throughout the state that stands by and ready to assist you all with all means. Uh, in regards to local redistricting. And if you want more information on what I talked about or what James talked about, here is, a, here is our website and the Census Bureau's website on the redistricting program. And with that, I'll turn it over to Tim. Okay. Thanks, Matthew. I appreciate that presentation. That's good stuff. Matthew is probably the first person in the state working on the 2020 census. Started back in probably 2015, 2016. So, um, for him, it's a five-year job, and then he gets five years off. Um, the chat's been pretty quiet, so we want to make sure that you have a chance to get you get your questions in and ask James and Matthew anything that you want to try to find out. Um, and over the next few minutes, we'll you know we can run a little past three if the questions start coming. That won't be a, that won't be a little bit of a problem. Um, first question from Lauren is, can we share the links at the end of the presentation again? We will uh, make sure that we get the slide decks up on the, both the video and the slide decks up on our website. We will uh, share those in a follow-up email that we'll likely send tomorrow. So uh, be looking for that um, as, as one of our follow-up activities. Um, I'll, throw a, I'll throw a question to Matthew. The first thing that I heard is, um, 
that I, that I didn't hear you mention was municipal uh, redistricting. And how would a city that needs to take on this issue that might have a 2021 election, uh, how would they go about doing their redistricting? Sure. I think they first need to, you know, our cities here in Tennessee are a little bit different in that not every single one is broken up to into awards or or city commission districts. So I think the first thing that we always recommend is for the cities to check their charter to see see if uh, if their city is broken up into wards. And then if that is the case, then they can reach out to our office to assist them in that redistricting process. Okay, thanks. We have, do you have a question in the chat? Exactly, who at the county level decides who does the redistricting? Is it a committee or otherwise? Who makes that decision about whether or not redistricting, who does redistricting and how it's done? Sure, it's gonna be done through the, um, through the county commission. The county commission will be the one that will form the redistricting committee if they like, and we would take our direction from the county commission um, when we're doing redistricting. Okay, um, I, have a, I have a question for, for James. Um, I know you've worked closely with the state and with Matthew on geography updates. Uh, hopefully the most, the majority, if not all of Tennessee's municipalities uh, participated in getting their, uh, you know, their boundaries in and, and they are accurately reflected. What if there's a, an error in uh, a boundary? How does that affect the data that comes out in, both in terms of the redistricting populations and you know, potentially corrections so that uh, appropriate funding is, uh, goes to the state through state share revenue programs that we do in Tennessee? So there is an appeals program that gets established in late uh, 2021. I believe the uh, invitation goes out September 1st to all the highest elected officials uh, and highest tribal officials uh, in each state. Uh, and it's called the Count Question Resolution Program. Uh, it doesn't change the redistricting counts and it doesn't change the uh, demographic housing and characteristic file, which is uh, the replacement this decade for summary file one but it does provide a recertified count to a state if an appeal was, uh, was accepted. Uh, for the type of appeal that you just described where it was a boundary that was inaccurate, uh, the jurisdiction would have to submit the appeal and the, the boundary that they're appealing would have had to be in effect, in effect by January 1st of 2020. And if that's the case and they can show it and they can show that, um, that housing units were affected because housing units were excluded or were included that shouldn't have been, uh, then that would go through that appeal process and they would provide that new certified count to uh, not only the jurisdiction that's doing the appeal, but any other jurisdictions that are affected by that change. The next question is in the chat. I'm not sure who's gonna to wanna to take this one. Um, what would it take to change the legislative redistricting to a nonpartisan commission. So this will be the state legislative redistricting process. Anyone want to weigh in? I mean, it would, it would take an act through the, through the legislature. There has been some bills that have been introduced over the last uh, couple of sessions to create this nonpartisan and they have not, um, they have not gained traction. Okay, anyone else want to throw any? If you're shy, is anyone on and just unmute and ask a question? Uh, since there's any other questions in the chat, is there anybody that would like to take advantage of that? The last, the last question I have uh, is for is for James relates to the apportionment counts. Um, you mentioned that that's kind of on hold. The redistricting is kind of on hold in terms of processing that until the apportionment counts are complete, the state level counts. Can you give us a little bit of information about the products that will be provided as part of the apportionment counts? I know that there's potentially more than one. Um, so I can say traditionally what comes out when we create the apportionment counts is uh, we provide the, what's called the resident population, which is the, 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 the folks who are resident within uh, the country. But then we also provide a secondary number called the federally affiliated count overseas. Uh, that is uh, something we collect through administrative records from uh, both the Department of Defense, the State Department, any agency that has uh, U.S. Uh, folks overseas uh, working on behalf of the federal government. And that count is only applied for the purposes of apportionment. Uh, we, get the, we get a state identifier with those 
uh, overseas folks and those they get counted into their state for the purposes of the apportionment count. Um, there is some discussion uh, around uh, uh, the presidential memo around um, uh, unauthorized immigrants or things like that, but um, that's not really a, a conversation that I'm I'm a part of, so I don't really know where that where that sits with the Census Bureau at the moment. So we're right at three. We've got one more. Let's see, um, Matthew, this one might be for you. How are prison populations factored into county level decisions? I guess we're talking as it relates to uh, the redistricting process at the county level. Did sure. Yeah. State level process as well. State yeah, on the on the state level, um, prisoners are counted where they reside uh, for purposes of legislative redistricting. Um, for purposes of the, the local counties, they can choose to actually remove that uh, that prison population. That was that was a change that was passed by the legislature three or four years ago that allows the counties to exclude um, exclude the prison population. We don't reallocate like some other states do. We're just we just remove them altogether. Okay. The next question, uh, also for you, Matthew, would be. How are university populations uh, factored into local redistricting? Sure, I mean, we, we include them where, where we use the census block. So wherever they're counted on April 1st of the data that we receive from, um, from James's group, that's where we count them. We do not mess with university students, military bases, nursing homes um, at all. The only one that we will remove is, um, is are the prisoners. And that is a local decision too. So not every county um, has elected to do that. Um, I know, I know it's a big deal for a Lake County, a Trousdale County, where you've got uh, a third of the, a third of the population is in prison in those counties. So doing local redistricting, uh, it, it becomes a really hard issue when you've got a, a census block with 2000, 3000 people in it, you click on one census block and it can change your deviation. Um, we all, we know that university populations are going to be, uh, an interesting result in the 2020 census given that a lot of university students return home right about the time that their census form hit the mailboxes so a lot of communities in tennessee are very interested to see how the university populations shake out not so much from the group course perspective students living in dorms but the, from the off-campus perspective how well those were counted uh, especially around the larger universities um, also for matthew will, the, will counties have access to the deviation uh, numbers and the deviation percentages in May of 2021? They will. That is part of the kickoff, uh, kickoff data that they receive. They get paper maps and they'll also get a digital version through our GIS software. But yes, and we're also, um, we're also looking at hosting via an ArcGIS dashboard, maybe of a county commission district deviation map. But yes, you, you'll get the, that, that one slide that was on my map, that the, um, of the map of Murray County, that's pretty, every county will get something like that that shows what districts are um, over deviation, the amount they need to, to get what the new ideal population. So they have all the decisions um, right there when we do release this data. Okay, it looks like that's all the questions we've got at this point. Um, we just just passed three o'clock, so we'll, we'll turn to wrapping this up. I wanna, again, thank uh, Mr. Whitehorn, Mr. Hill for joining us today. Um, really great information from them, um, and we look forward to kind of watching the schedule of the redistricting data and learn more about when it's going to be coming out. We'll be following up with an email with the links uh, the, the, to the with a way to download those presentations that you just saw. You can re review the video as well, and also check. Be sure to check out our third webinar in our fall series about uh, census crosswalks and using historic GIS data to assess change in communities. Um, it's very powerful information and, and it can create a lot of good stories to tell and all your GIS folks that work in the cities and counties are dying to do it. So um, they would love to learn more about it. Give them a, a, a heads up if you haven't. And again, thanks everyone for joining us and we'll, uh, we'll sign off. Thank you. Hey, thanks. James, I appreciate it. Matthew, I appreciate it. Thank you guys. Great information. Thanks Aaron, by the way.